You mentioned writing your memoirs. Uh, what's it been like working on your memoirs? Well, gosh, it's like a death wish. It's it's a I mean, it's it's a different kind of writing, and it's really hard, and it's dealing with things that you that have long forgotten, and rightfully so. There's a reason why we forget things, and to have to relive them is not all that easy. And then write about it, and then edit it, and edit, and edit, and edit, and edit. So I can't tell you how many rounds of editing I've gone through, self-imposed and otherwise. Um, forgive me for even asking, they have not yet been published. No. Is that right? You're still working on them. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the state uh, that they're in as of March 2007? They're getting there. <laughs> I'm in the process of cutting them way down. And they're getting there. Oh, it's written. It's just a matter of editing. It's like I said, I'm not saying anything about editing briefs that I don't practice myself. So I'm just editing. And it's a lot of work. I've been up now since 2.30. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, you you just keep cranking away. I don't like it. I can't tell you I like it, but it's just got to be done. You say never again on these memoirs. Yeah. On the other hand, you've got 30 or 40 great years ahead of you. Yeah, but I'm not writing about it. <laughs> I don't care what anybody says. You know, the, what I don't, what, you know, I'm not writing about it. I really don't. To be honest with you, I don't really want to write about it anymore. You know, I'm just, I don't want to write about me anymore. I don't want to talk about me anymore. One last question about that. What is the great challenge of uh, composing your own life into a narrative? The narrative, the, mem the remembering, all of it's hard. There's no easy part of it. The remembering, the recording, then the putting it down uh, in some form, which, and then putting it down in a way that makes it readable. In other words, accessible again. And for in an audience that you're totally unfamiliar, at least in the last almost two decades, of dealing with directly in that way. So I mean, it's, it's different and it's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the most important part of a brief? Oh, <laughs> I like the summary of the argument. I think that um, it gives you a preview. It's like giving you, you know, what's going to be on TV next week. You know, if you watch the television program 24 years, or what's going to happen next week. And, or it like, gives me, it says, here's what I'm going to tell you. And it's, if you can capture that, I remember Justice Black, that's what I got that from Justice Blackman. Because he would be very upset when someone left the summary of the argument out. People don't read, people, each of us reads a brief differently. I never read the jurisdiction statement or anything like that. I don't read the facts. You know, I go right to what you have to say. And then there's some of the points to me I don't care. Because I've already, you know, you've thought about those. You want, there's some, we granted, Cert for, for you to answer a particular question. And some people think they need to write these Brandeis briefs, you know. Well, I'm not into Brandeis briefs. We ask a legal question, I want a legal answer. And um, I would say the summary of the uh, argument. Do you think statements of fact tend to be too long? I don't read them. Ever? I can't, I may have, I can't say ever, but I don't as a matter of course read them. I read the Court of Appeals a bit. Mm -hmm. And that has a statement of facts. Before we sat down for this interview, you said you thought that was the best brief of all. Oh, I do. I think it is because judges are engaged in the exact same job I'm engaged in. They're not advocating a position. They're not uh, trying to push the law a particular direction. They're judges. They had some parties before them. They had briefs. And they had to decide and they had to explain their decision, etc. Same thing I have to do. And so I go to them. They're um, as co-participants in this process. And that's not to denigrate the lawyers. But if the Court of Appeals judge has already stated the facts, then I take that and I'm, I go on. Now, just very complicated facts. There was a wonderful brief some years ago. 
we had a case involving, uh, it was an electric uh, utility case involving these grids. We had a, an amicus brief by engineers supporting neither side, neither party, explaining the nature of a grid. It was well written. It's a wonderful explanation. It wasn't there to make to say this or to say that about the legal argument, but we wanted you to fully understand what a grid was. <laughs> what a great brief. <laughs> and I, I think of judges as sort of that, that way. It's, you know, we might not agree, but we have the same job. Did the engineers who wrote that just have the feeling that uh, the advocates, uh, the adversaries weren't necessarily explaining uh, for the court what the problem was? Isn't that, that's, that's probably true. That they were so uh, involved in the back and forth and using whatever page limitations they had to make their arguments that they were shortchanging the explanation about grids. You know, one says, I didn't unfairly keep you off the grid. The other says, yes, you did. But the engineer says, look, here's what a grid is. Electricity doesn't move around. This is how you do it. It is fascinating. It's a wonderful brief. And helpful to the court. Oh, it's helpful to me. It's the same thing when you get, in some, you get involved in some of these technology cases, whether it's... Uh, uh, software or hardware that's fairly complicated, the uh, um, case involving you know a patent or something, and you get an explanation. And now, of course, you know they're getting to the point where they even put the explanations, an example of a patent at a website, or they put it on a CD, and you can just observe it on your computer and just see how it works. It's really interesting. But I think those are that again. There is someone who doesn't have an interest or a stake in the outcome, who's just simply saying, I want you to know this is how it works. And there's no debate about that. Uh, it's just a wonderful thing. And I, that's the way I see judges. Just here's what we think, and here's the case, here are the facts, and we don't have. We're not upset. We're not trying to skew the facts anyways. So they're the honest broker in the process. What is the difference between a really good Court of Appeals opinion and a not so good one. Oh my goodness. I, I think again it's clarity. I think it's the ones who set out the facts in a way that are, really, are relevant. I think most of them are pretty good. I mean you get some that, that could be a little better but I think I'd have to say in my time up here most of the Court of Appeals opinions I've seen just, I think we, it, there's a lot to be proud of in the system. I think they do a wonderful job. I think these busy district judges who sit down with all the things they have going on and they write these opinions that when do they get the time? Or these these magistrate judges who write bankruptcy judges. I think, I think we may have flaws in the system but I think it's a wonderful system and I think the judges a lot of times come in for too much abuse and and the, I try to be respectful to them when, when, when I write because I know that it is a lot of work. You just read some of the things that these magistrate judges and these district judges are doing on a daily basis, and managing their dockets and things. And you look at some of these courts of appeals and some complicated cases that they're dealing with. And the way, what they do for us is, and this is why when you, you, we hate it, when you skip the Court of Appeals and you expedite something beyond the Court of Appeals, they are the winnowing process for us. When we get it, it's refined. They have gotten a lot of the chaff out and the big chunks out of the system, and what we get is a case that's ready to be decided. Sometimes when we don't grant cert on a case, the reason is we say it needs to percolate a little more. We should say it needs to be refined a little more. It needs to be, be, go in the mill just a little, and then it comes to us. But we can reach into that process sometimes and take cases prematurely and they're not ready. But I think the judges do a great job. So I would say cases, most of the Court of Appeals cases are, are just fine. Do you find it difficult to take complex problems that come before you, some of the most complex problems in the world, and reduce them to a yes or a no? 
Uh, not really, because we ask specific questions. We don't ask for all that complexity. We, we answer a specific question. You know, some years ago when it was clear that we were going to begin to get cases involving the Internet, I remember spending a summer learning what the heck the Internet was. This was early on. And I had an old computer and I pulled it apart so I could find out what a BIOS was and what the memory was and the processor and things like that. Because, and, you know, that's 10, 12 years ago now. Well, it was actually more 12, 13 years ago. But the point is simply this. We knew it was coming. So it's time to get ready for it and to begin to understand it. So I think that the cases might be complicated, but you have smart people up here, and we ask very, we ask not very precise questions, but discreet questions that we would like to answer. First thing that one sees in opening a U.S. Supreme Court brief, just inside the front cover, are the questions presented. Mm -hmm. How important are they to you? I think that's. I think they're very important. That's the question we ask, and sometimes we, and I think we do it. I have a little fear sometimes when we change the question presented, but that's what we get. We granted the case on. That's what we vote on. That's what we'll do on Friday. We go. You asked. You said you, you brought the case here, and you said. He petitioned for search the and he said, this is the question I'd like the court to answer. And the, you know, as I noted in an earlier conversation before we went on tape, that I think it's problematic when people have one question presented in the cert petition and then change it in, the, uh, in, in, in their opening briefs. And some people go so far in the respondent's brief to write us another question presented. And I don't know what <laughs> gives them license to do that. We asked you what we wanted to. This is what you asked, and this is what we granted on, and that's the one you should answer. In his final argument before the U.S. Supreme Court, Charles Allen Wright wrote an amicus brief um, in which I thought the question presented was no good. Before he filed the brief, he showed it to me, and I rewrote the question presented for him. I said, that's the one you need to ask. That's a much clearer question. And he refused to change it because that was not the one on which cert was granted, That's right. and he did the right thing. He did the right thing, and at the time to rewrite that question presented is at the cert petition stage. It's We didn't ask the, the new question you asked, and that's not the one on which we granted cert. And some people try to do that in different ways. They don't change the question presented itself, but they change everything else. They, they change the question they answer, and that sleight of hand is not well received. Do you have a view on these very long, convoluted sentences, beginning with whether and trying to stuff it all into one sentence in the question presented, as opposed to a couple of short sentences and then asking a shorter, more punchy question? Well, I don't know it have to be punchy. You can break it up. I mean, there's no... I've gone through tons of these things, and people have different things. I don't think it should be some great, big, long indecipherable paragraph, right? two or three things. You know, there's a question and there are these sub-questions and, or there might be three questions and they're related. And I tend to not like to separate out questions because sometimes when we do that, like for example, we grab on cert on question two. Well, sometimes one and three were also necessary. It was a part of the whole and then we live the regret. There are some cases you know, if you go back and you look at, just before I got here, you look at the busing cases out of Kansas City. Well, the search should have been granted on everything, probably. But the if I were here, that's the way I would have voted. And then you don't have to answer everything at the court. You can choose not to answer this question because the case can be decided on the first two questions. But sometimes you run the risk of eliminating a question that would you would have answered had it been presented. And, and, I, and I think that risk is too great to do that. But I think it, it's, I would break them up a little bit and not have real long questions that run a whole page or a half a page. 